Most gracious God, we do thank you for this chance to open up your word once again and to look into the biblical nature of sacrificial love, another pillar of Christian character. And God, we ask your help for our hearts and minds and souls to profit from this word and bless us, God, as we do study it. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, my friends, well, we're going to um, go ahead and uh, continue our series together uh, today, and we're going to talk about, uh, notice the adjective, uh, biblical love, biblical love. The reason why we use that adjective is the concept of love, kind of generally speaking, I think it's safe to say is very misunderstood today, probably thanks in large part to media and even the entertainment culture that we are all kind of awash in. Usually there, love is defined in uh, subjective, even sensual terms. And it tends to be, I think, trivialized through television and movies, radio, magazines, and of course the internet. And for that reason, I think many Christians are often confused by kind of a contemporary emphasis on love and toleration, in particular in service to the LGBTQ uh, revolution around us. And so to think clearly and biblically about the uh, selfless nature of biblical love, I'd like to invite you to turn first to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 7. And uh, we're going to look at a couple of texts this morning, one a very famous one in the Gospel of John chapter 13, where we'll end up. But we want to begin first in Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 7, where we are going to see love, love biblically defined. And so let me read that with you, and um, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Paul writes, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper amongst saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. So we begin today with Ephesians 5, and the reason why we want to turn to God's Word is, as it is for any sinful and, and muddled perspective on a spiritual topic like love, the Bible really is the best source for clarifying our thinking on this important concept. And of course, God's Word makes numerous references to the topic of love, but I think Ephesians 5 here, beginning when verses 1 and 2, kind of provides for us an entry point into this subject and really an excellent definition of love. Let's just hear those two verses again now that we've heard the entire thing. Paul writes, he says, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. Notice, who we are to follow and imitate, and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So we start at this point of comparison in Ephesians 5. If we want to imitate God, if you and I want to be known as children of God, we need to walk in what? Paul tells us, right? We need to walk in love because God himself, as John tells us in his first epistle, uh, God is love. And we really can only imitate God so far as we let Christ live his perfect life through us and we depend completely on the indwelling spirit of God. And so love is, as a pillar of Christian character, a very Trinitarian ethic. 
It's a virtue in our lives, right? That's brought forward in us because the Father first loved us, Christ redeemed us in love, and we are sanctified in love by the Spirit. And of course, for that reason, Christ becomes our supreme example of this particular pillar of our Christian character. The noblest divine characteristic, if you will, we can imitate is sacrificial love, which notice in verse 2, we're pointed towards, aren't we? It says in verse 2, Jesus gave himself up for whom? Not for himself, right? For us, for us. Absolutely. That was the height of what is known very famously as agape love or sacrificial love. Agape love. And this is the kind of um, sacrificial love which drove Christ on the cross to do what he did. So when we talk about love then this morning, As a virtue in our lives, we're not simply talking about good feelings about another person. You know, I can have affection for you all. Um, I can have a different kind of love for Rachel. I can have a, a kind of love for God. But here, what we're really being pointed towards as an ethic of biblical love is the kind of sacrificial love which Christ had for us when he gave himself up on the cross, right? Christ did not sacrifice himself for us because we were so deserving, but he did so because out of his gracious love, paying sin's enormous penalty for all who believe, right? God is the ultimate expression of sacrificial love. And so we need to probably just state something really clearly. Already you might in your mind have a tension. There is a difference, of course, between God's unconditional love and the often conditional love that we manifest in our own lives. That's just honest. That's one of the big differences between God's love and ours. Oftentimes our love is conditional and conditional love is manifested when people withhold a love from anyone who doesn't meet their expectations, right? If you don't treat me how I want to be treated, I am not going to love you. And that's why Ephesians 5 verse 2, where we just looked a minute ago, really is the clearest Uh, It is the most precise definition of the attitude of love, I think, found anywhere in God's word. And so we're reminded here up front, is love primarily an emotion? Let me ask you that. Is love primarily an emotion? It's not primarily uh, an emotion, right? It uh, is not just primarily an emotion that makes us feel warm or sentimental. Rather, biblical love is an act of self-sacrifice. And we really do realize that when we see that God loved us as he gave his son for us. And so as we're called to imitate this kind of love, we're really called to go to lengths which are kind of difficult for us to imagine. And so it's a radical call to love the way that Christ loved us. Now, We already have one hand tied behind our back then for that reason, right? We are sinful creatures. Our imagination for love is already kind of stunted, so to speak. But let me look here secondly in our outline, one of the other reasons why I think we have a challenge in terms of love, and that is because the world, right, the system of the world around us often perverts this kind of understanding of biblical love. There is a kind of air that we breathe these days, which makes it very difficult. And as I said when we began uh, this morning, the world, for the most part, really knows nothing about the biblical definition of love. That sounds pretty negative, but I think it's also uh, true. In fact, look again at Ephesians uh, 5, beginning in verse 3. The Apostle Paul highlights this truth, right, by contrasting our need to copy and imitate the love of God and the need to avoid the world's kind of perverse expression of love. Verse 3, he says this, but do not let, what does your translation say there? But do not let, what Chip? 
Must not be a hint of, okay. And then what does it say there should not be a hint of there? Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Very good. Does a lot of people's translations have just immorality there? I have this new King James Version. What do you have there? Very good. Yeah. Anybody have anything else? Steve, ESV? Yeah. Yeah. They really unpack it there. Do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper amongst the saints. Now, why would we have Paul chasing this glorious, exalted verse 2 that really puts biblical love in spotlight and contrasting it with what is essentially a counterfeit, which we could be pulled towards. Well, to be quite honest about it, it's because Satan always seems to counterfeit the good things that God establishes. Uh, Another way of saying that uh, is God creates the thesis, the thing, the main thing, and Satan seems to uh, create the antithesis in many ways, which serves his purposes and not God's. And so in contrast to God's unselfish love, God's unconditional love, God's uh, beautiful self-giving love, Satan promotes a very different kind of love. What would we say the kind of love that he's promoting in the world today? What do you think, Margie? Selfish, Selfish, yeah, self-centered. Absolutely. We might even go further because think about what your translations say in verse 3. What kind of love is it? Kind of a lustful love, isn't it? Right? It's a very self-indulgent love, uh, to Margie's point. Pure versus impure. God is pure. Yep. And then the world is just so not. Yeah. God is so pure in him, there is no darkness. And so in the antithesis of this biblical virtue, Satan creates something very counterfeit, something in which there is quite a bit of darkness, right? Uh, Lustful, porneic love. Uh, It's no surprise then that Satan's brand of love, I think inevitably leads to immorality and impurity. Um, If you think about how this plays out in the world today, today, uh, if someone is single and falls in love, it often almost immediately leads to fornication um, with a person uh, uh, that they're not married to. Um, In the married world, if someone's married and falls in love with a person other than his or her spouse, that often leads to an impure and adulterous affair. Um, If someone falls in love with another person of the same sex today, even though that's very mainstream and accepted, uh, that person assumes it's all right to engage in homosexual activity, which the Bible is very clear is is not sanctioned of uh, God. And so contrary to the kind of revolutionaries around us, love is not just love, right? Love is love is kind of the mantra of the revolution today. But you could carry that motto in very, very impure and dangerous places, and we already see that happening. In fact, just to drill down on that a little bit, I don't want to be too annoying here, but look at verse 3 in your Bibles. Uh, That word immorality there um, is, uh, and I think it's translated different ways. Some say sexual immorality, just to put the point on it. But the word immorality there is from a Greek word porneia, porneia. Does that sound like any of our words in the English language? The reason I'm drawing attention to this is because this is the counter to biblical love. There's agape, and then what the world has is the antithesis of that, which is porneia, porneia. And if that word sounds like any English word, you'd probably have to admit it sounds a lot like pornography, pornography, right? Um, It is the um, opposite of what Paul says our sexual ethic, our love ethic is to be about, which if you read the Bible, the ethic of love we are to have is always to be self-controlled, right? We're not to use our bodies in the same way as uh, those who are outside of Christ. And so how do people use their bodies or their sexuality if they're outside of Christ? They give themselves to immorality. And here this term, this Greek term, it's, it's kind of all-encompassing, right? So even though we have a Greek word pornography, 
porneia is much broader uh, than that. This would include any and really all sexual activity outside the context of just one limited thing, a marriage between one woman and one man. So bestiality, porneia. The New King Cor James calls it fornication. Fornication, yeah. And my understanding was that fornication was sexual immorality apart from marriage, whereas adultery was sexual immorality within the marriage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Greek word, so that's, that's a really good point, and the Greek word here, porneia, would even be broader than just those limited, uh, kind of like fornication typically seen as sexual activity between unmarried uh, persons. Porneia could be uh, very uh, broad. Any kind of sexual activity outside of a marital sexual activity. So the viewing of even pornography, which is I think a huge issue today. Now that pornography has moved into the internet, that's porneia. Um, any kind of sexual activity with um, minors, with um, animals, all of those things that are condemned in God's law in the Old Testament would be uh, properly defined as porneia. And the problem as Paul is kind of unpacking this idea of biblical love is by the world's standards, there's kind of a loss of control. In fact, we see that loss of self-control here in verse 3 because it leads to impurity, impurity. Um, this is another Greek word that's pretty inclusive. In fact, Jesus uses the same Greek word here that's translated impurity in the New American Standard when he describes the rottenness that dwells in tombs. He uses that phrase in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, in other New Testament passages, the same word translated impurity is used to refer to lustful passions, even impure ideas fantasies and other forms of sexual sin. And so remember one of the things that I think is so harrowing about the Sermon on the Mount is uh, Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery with another person, right? And here he's referring to that specific context. Do you remember what Jesus said? But I tell you, if you lust after another person, this is the impurity of mine, you've already committed adultery with them. And so Jesus really kicks it up uh, a notch. Yeah. So immorality and purity. Now, let me show you just one other thing before we move into kind of the biblical ethic of love, which is so uh, captivating, I think, to Christian people. Immorality and impurity. These are both here in Ephesians 5 verse 3. What ultimately are they? Where do they come from? And the answer is in some way they are both expressions of, of a very selfish, Margie used the word kind of self-centered, they are expressions of a selfish sexual greed. And greed in many ways is contrary to the nature of biblical love, which is self-sacrificing. And so the quickest way to undermine biblical love is to be given over to the sin of greed being very self-focused rather than other focused. That's why so often we encounter in the Bible, the Bible's teachings pulling us outside of ourselves and orienting us towards God and other people. Remember the greatest commandments? There's only two, right? Loving God with all that we are and loving others, our neighbors as ourselves. You see, it pulls us outside of ourselves because really left to our own devices, we very much want to be on the throne of our lives. We don't want to be oriented to others. I want to take care of myself. And God shows us a better way, a way that actually helps us flourish. And so immorality and impurity rooted in greediness, sexual greediness. And I would suggest to you, and just think about this for a moment, as you think about what the world is around us today, Strong sexual greed is kind of everywhere. Uh, strong sexual greed that will often stop at nothing on its way to fulfilling its lusts. Okay, And because I do think that most people who are not under the reign of Christ are so pulled by the powerful urges within themselves, we see now sexual sin kind of getting completely out of control. 
uh, often kind of accompanied by a complete insensitivity to others' feelings and well-being. I want to think of David and Bathsheba. Yes. Uh, you know, it started out with what the New King James calls covenants. covenants yes. Where, uh, and then it led to snowball downhill, sin after sin after sin. A terrible snowball of sin, didn't it? Yeah, I remember when I was in the service, you know, I was 19, 20 years old, a young Marine, and uh, a lot of the Marines around me, man, the way that they spent their paychecks every weekend was they would go booze it up and chase skirts. <laughs> and uh, girls, women, young women were a conquest for them. And they were just looking to make the latest notch, you know, kind of thing. It was incre incredibly self-centered. And of course, we know that uh, the selfish sexual greed that leads to this kind of immorality, it can really produce uh, terrible consequences, even murder. I mean, sadly, uh, one of the, the, the most uh, prominent uh, uh, things in our culture today since the early 70s has been legalized abortion. And I always say that very sensitively. I know there are likely people in our own church who have experienced abortions. And of course, for women who experience that, it often breaks them in spiritual ways. And I always like to remind people there is forgiveness in Christ uh, for that as well. But I think part of the sexual ethic of the 60s, which kind of became liberated, led to the logic of, you know, what we now experience as abortion. And so in many ways, our modern society around us is a kind of picture of a culture that has radically redefined love. That's kind of what we're getting at here. And it's got away from the self-sacrificial, unconditional sur uh, concern for others to a kind of greedy and lustful concern for sexual freedom and fulfillment. And you probably don't need me to remind you that this couldn't be any more counter to what the Bible teaches uh, about uh, love. So, how will today's sex-saturated society ever, seen genuine, uh, ever see genuine love displayed? That's where you and I come in, dear friends. So let's get a little bit of a sense of what biblical love is, now that we've talked about the, the really downside, the dark side of, of worldly love. Turn in your Bibles to John 13, if you would. John 13. I think John 13 provides a, a really penetrating insight into the needed and divinely inspired attitude of love. And um, Steve, I'm going to ask you to do a longer reading. Do you mind? I like your new haircut, so I feel like we need to... You're pretty high speed, low drag now. So I, I need to get you a chance to do a good reading. Um, uh, that's not Second John. <laughs> this is John. <laughs> There's no such thing as Second John 13, but if anybody went searching for that, you'd be here a long time. John 13, 1 through 17, if you don't mind. Perfect. Thanks. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you will have no care with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but it is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, 
blessed are you. Okay, very fine reading. Thank you for that, uh, Steve. Uh, so we're at uh, the famous Upper Room Discourses in the Gospel of uh, John. And this episode takes place in the Upper Room, uh, really during the uh, fateful evening before Jesus was crucified, when Judas Iscariot betrayed him to the Jewish leaders and the Roman authorities. Now, the scene is they are at dinner together. They're going to observe the Lord's Supper, and Jesus is going to uh, say some very important things that we now commemorate uh, the remembrance of him saying and celebrating in the Lord's Supper each Sunday morning. But the scene is a little bit a scene of contrast because here's Jesus doing some of the most incredible teaching, uh, uh, demonstrative teaching on love ever. And what are the disciples doing? <laughs> Well, the disciples are there, if you know this text, and they have been caught up in a, a pretty selfish debate about which of them would be greatest uh, in the kingdom of God. Uh, none of them seem to have had the least bit of sensitivity or consideration for what the Lord was about to endure, uh, even though just recently he had actually told them that very soon he was going to die and not be with them much longer. And I think uh, all of those negative factors probably would have made the disciples pretty unlovable by human standards. But verse 1 says that here Jesus, the Son of God, right, loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the end. Christ's love towards his own was and is unconditional. That's what we're being told. He loved the disciples to the utmost even when they... In this instance, we're displaying a pretty ugly indifference uh, to him. Uh, one of the phrases that my children have picked up from me over the years is the phrase, hey, read the room. <laughs> and they use that sometimes against each other like a war club. That's not what I intended for them to do, but that's how siblings are sometimes when somebody is being insensitive. <laughs> And so, hey, dude, read the room. And I knew it had really caught on when I heard little seven-year-old uh, Trinity utter those very words. She even said, dude, <laughs> which was really funny. Hey, dude, read the room. So she's passing it on to her younger brother who was acting up while mom and dad were having a, a heartfelt and emotional conversation uh, about somebody uh, who was going through some suffering. <laughs> so Trinity turned to Abram. Hey, dude, read the room. <laughs> which was beautiful. We might say the same to the apostles <laughs> this night. Hey, dudes, read the room. They're arguing over who's greatest. But as we see beginning in verse 3, right, verse 3 begins to unfold uh, the actual demonstration of Jesus's love. He knew God the Father had given all things into his hands, that he'd been sent to the earth by the Father, that he would return to God at the proper time, and kind of with this supernatural calm, right? With the perfect assurance that all the surrounding events, they were under the Father's control, Jesus turned his very loving attention towards the disciples. We see that in verse 4. And he took off his outer garment. He stripped down to his undergarments, probably leaving his legs and upper body bare. And he took a towel and he proceeded with the task of washing the disciples feet. Now I know this is a pretty familiar uh, story uh, from the Bible, but it doesn't hurt reminding ourselves that in the ancient uh, Middle East it was appropriate because of both custom, hospitality, but also because of necessity to wash feet prior to a meal. <laughs> in those days, people wore sandals over bare feet as they trod over dusty, uh, unpaved roads and paths. And it was only fitting that when a banquet was being held, that a host or one of his servants would wash the dirty feet of the guests. Uh, d dinners in that day were kind of prolonged affairs where people often reclined next to each other. And so your dirty feet might be just a foot from where my head was as I was eating, reclining. And so uh, clean feet greatly improved, let's just say, the ambiance of the dinner. 
And so normally this foot washing uh, task went to the slave who was kind of lowest in the social ladder within the room. It was not really an agreeable job, but it was a part of Middle Eastern hospitality. Well, apparently the room, the upper room where Jesus and the disciples are, it didn't have a servant, right? And there wasn't anybody available. And also, none of the disciples had volunteered for this task. We kind of see this at this point. Probably nobody had volunteered because what are they discussing at this point? Which of us are the greatest in this kingdom that Jesus is launching? Who has the loftiest position? Well, the last thing you want to do to make your case that you're really up there on the food chain is start washing everybody's feet. And this is kind of fresh in everyone's mind. So what happens? Well, the loftiest one ever, right, stands up and he humbly takes the initiative and he begins doing what nobody else in the room was evidently willing to do. As he came with his towel and his basin of water to Peter, I'm imagining there was something of a silence in the room, like what is happening? The men were witnessing the king of glory really undertaking one of the menial and unpleasant tasks of servanthood. But Peter, in his frequent role as spokesperson for the group, I always have a heart for Peter. Like Peter, I sometimes stick my own foot in my mouth, and I think that's who Peter is as well. Peter breaks the silence. So take a look at verse 6. <laughs> Peter asked Jesus a question, Lord, do you wash my feet? It's kind of like him saying, Lord, you shouldn't be doing this. Jesus' answer, verse 7, What I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. All right, this is evidently an indication that Peter and the others still don't really understand the extent of the Lord's condescension on their behalf. And of course, we have recently heard some sermons over Philippians 2 that remind us how far down Jesus condescended. But the, the disciples like us are still learning the lesson. But here's Peter, and so in Peter's typically bold fashion, he persisted in telling Jesus it was just not right that he should ever wash his feet. And that prompted our Lord to set the record straight concerning the spiritual meaning of what he was doing. Take a look at verse 8. He says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. This is really fundamental, right? His meaning. Peter and anyone else who would have a saving relationship with God must have their life washed, regenerated, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is crucial. Peter would learn that lesson and he would proclaim it broadly uh, in Jerusalem and in all Judea. But we see that Peter at this point in his quest is persevering to understand what Jesus was saying. And so he does a kind of about face, verse 9. And he insists that Christ wash not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Peter likes the sound of this. He definitely wanted a relationship with Christ, but he was still unclear regarding exactly what he needed from the Lord at that moment. And so therefore, Jesus, he kind of further goes on to illuminate the spiritual significance of the action. Look at verse 10. <laughs> Jesus says, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean. <laughs> I used this one time on Abram. He did not understand what I was saying. He had already had his evening bath, but he decided that he had left some toys in the backyard and he ran through mud and he got those toys and brought them back and then proceeded to tell dad that I need another bath. And so I quoted John 13 10 to him. He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet. <laughs> to which Abram looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Anyways, essentially Jesus is here and he is saying that there was a time when all of us who are believers experience this washing of regeneration, right? Uh, this moment of baptism. And that's when we were spiritually washed head to toe, sins cleansed. But as we walk through the world and we become contaminated in the dust, so to speak, the dirt of a very sinful society, as we always do, we do need to have our feet washed. We need the daily confession. We need repentance as an ethic and cleansing that keeps our feet clean and allows us to have fellowship with Christ and to carry out his will.
And so Jesus here is affirming that, yes, indeed, Peter has been truly saved, cleansed from his sins. He didn't need another bath, but he did need that constant spiritual foot cleansing that would maintain his walk with the Lord. It's a good job uh, of Jesus to remind Peter of this. It's also helpful for us to hear that as well. What do we really need? We need the daily washing from Christ. We need to be cleansed as well. Walk in the light. Yeah. And so Jesus, he finishes the job of washing the other disciples' feet, at which point he kind of summarizes the overall significance of the actions in verses 12 through 16, which we won't read. But what I do want us to notice is this profound object lesson, right, um, in how love acts. Uh, we're told right in verse 1 that Jesus loved these men to the end, that is, to the maximum. That's really the way that that Greek word telos is used there. He loved them to the ultimate extent, which means he humbly displayed selfless sacrifice and he met their needs and he meets our needs at the lowliest, most basic level. That's what's so wonderful about Christ's love. And that selflessness would soon go beyond just foot washing, of course, to within 24 hours doing the ultimate act of love on the cross itself. And he would bear their sins and ours, including all those sins of indifference and selfishness that frequently make us ourselves kind of unlovable. And so obviously Jesus' attitude of love demonstrated here can overcome even the greatest resistance we can mount against it. And so let's end then in this place, kind of the application of genuine love. We're talking about the various pillars of Christian character, and, and love is really up there. This is a very important one. You're already in John 13, so Ray, could I call on you to read something? Would you mind reading verses 34 and 35 in that chapter? Even though uh, Jesus defines foot washing as an example of love, the disciples should follow. He really spells out in this same chapter the clearest application of love. That's what Ray's getting ready to read. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Great. So what's the call on us today? We are to simply follow Jesus' pattern. We are to love others sacrificially, meeting their needs. And above all, whose example do we follow? We follow the example of Christ. And so if the body of Christ, the church, is really to be conformed to the image of Christ, then its members, we must demonstrate the love that Jesus has shown to us. That's why we're talking about the pillar of biblical love, the extent and the nature of biblical love, beautifully illustrated in these two places in the Bible.